so thank you all for sticking with us through all this. Uh, this is incredibly important stuff. Um, and more importantly, uh, one of the key things about how you fix healthcare is that everybody's got to change. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And uh, maybe picking up on Larry's theme, uh, if we do it the right way, maybe it won't seem quite as hard as everybody thinks it's going to be. Um, but this is actually, it's, it's the burning platform. And in fact, if you don't think something's going to happen about healthcare change, it is in fact what the deficit uh, in Washington is all about. And it's what the super committee in Washington is trying to grapple with now is healthcare. Because you can't solve the federal deficit if you don't solve the healthcare problem. Now, if you're in Washington, um, what are your choices? Well, Medicare is the big driver. And basically, like every other uh, thing, it has a simple economic equation. It's spending is quantity times price. So you can either figure out how you're going to cut services to seniors, or you're going to figure out how you cut how much you pay to the providers. And guess which one? They're likely to pick. Congress is not going to cut services to seniors. So what they have been doing for years and years and years is figuring out how to cut payments to providers. And in fact, the, uh, the doctors have been the ones who've been taking this on the chin for the longest period of time. If you wonder why when you go to your doctor they're not happy, particularly if you're on Medicare, it's because um, there is this looming 30% cut in physician fees coming from Medicare, uh, which Congress keeps kicking the can down the road every year, but right now they can't figure out how to get past that. So it is entirely possible that if we don't do something different in healthcare, that your doctor is going to get paid 30% less for doing um, for you. And the typical solution in the past was what was called cost shifting. It's sort of like a balloon, okay? If, if Medicare squeezes the balloon at this end, it's going to pop out the other end. And so the pressure was relieved by shifting costs to the private sector. Um, that can't happen anymore either, and the reason is this. Um, I'm not a big fan of the percent of GDP charts because I don't think that people wake up in the morning worrying about what percent of the GDP is going to something. But uh, this is an interesting chart because it says that what makes the United States higher as a percentage of GDP compared to other countries is not what the public sector spends, it's what the private sector spends, it's what businesses are spending. And in fact, if you look at what has happened over time, uh, just in the past decade, what businesses are paying for health care has increased dramatically, doubled, and where the people who are really even taking more on the chin now are the consumers. Because even though that's still a small percentage of the cost, it's the consumer share has quadrupled or quintupled over the past decade. And if that's not obvious enough that that's a whole lot faster than either inflation or wage increases, that should make it clear. Because premiums have gone up by 140 to 160%, while wages have only gone up by 42%. And there was a study in the magazine Health Affairs back in September where the authors said, let's figure out what this has meant to the typical family of four. What it's meant is that in the course of a decade, basically all of their increased earnings went to inflation and health care. Left them a grand total of $95 more for actual new spending. And it has really, completely disrupted our economy. Maine used to make things. Now it operates like and that's something that's not sustainable as a nation. We've got to get back to the point where we're manufacturing things and shipping them around the country, not uh, taking care of people in healthcare. But to do that, you've got to find some way to reduce costs without rationing. Uh, and the challenge is that you can't reduce costs without rationing from Washington. This comes back to what Elizabeth said at the very beginning of the program today, is it's got to be done at the local level. It's got to be done here in Maine. So, um, how you do that? Uh, and I've been kind of depressed when I've gone around the country to find how many people say there's no way that you can reduce healthcare costs without rationing. You've got to take stuff away from people. It's the only way we're going to be able to save money. And I don't buy that. Uh, I think there's three major ways that you can reduce costs without rationing. One, you heard um, in very eloquently just a minute ago, is keeping people well. If people stay well, they don't have healthcare costs at all. That saves money. Uh, if they do get some kind of a chronic disease, <coughs> that you manage that chronic condition in some way so that people don't have to be hospitalized as often today, or they don't get unnecessary um, acute care episodes. And if they do end up in the hospital, that you don't have all those complications, infections, and readmissions the way Karen Feinstein described this morning, and that it gets delivered in an efficient, effective way as possible. 
And the nice thing about that model, that way of thinking about things, is all of those things will save money. And they are all also quality improvements for patients. And I think that if we said to the people of the American people and to the Mainers, um, uh, what do you want? What we're trying to do for you is we're trying to keep you well, help you stay out of the hospital if you don't need to be there, and make sure that when you do go to the hospital that you have a successful outcome. I think most people would say, sounds pretty good to me. So how's Maine doing? Well, it's actually hard to figure that out. It's very hard to figure out how anybody is doing in healthcare today because we don't have good information. Um, what you can tell you is that Maine has the fifth highest insurance premiums for single individuals in the country, has the tenth highest family insurance premiums in the country. And if you look at this in 2010, if you look at that, that says that just if you were only average, you'd be saving $650 per premium per household per year. That's on the order of $150 to $200 million a year for Maine. So why are the insurance premiums so high in Maine? I don't know. And you don't need it. And in fact, you should be a little annoyed that you don't know. Because if you don't know why they're high, what are you going to do about it? So I'll give you some clues, because it's very hard to figure this out. Why are healthcare costs higher in Maine? Is it because people are sicker here? Well, this is the preceding chart to the diabetes chart you saw a second ago, is that people across the country are becoming more and more obese. And in fact, in Maine, the obesity rate has almost doubled in the course of the past few decades. Is that why healthcare costs are higher here? Maybe, but you're um, having the same problem lots of other places have in that regard. Although you can see, you're more in the orange range than some other places are. Um, you don't send people to the hospital quite as often here, overall, uh, the population as other places. You're actually a little bit below the national average, but if you look at some of your neighboring states, they're sending people to the hospital less often than you are, 25 to 30, 10, you're doing it 10 to 25 percent more often. So there's a potential cost. Um, and what's really remarkable is that people in Maine go to the emergency room at the second highest rate of any place in the country. Think that doesn't cost you some money? You think that they get the best uh, care there? And you've seen here some of the sort of well above average in terms of the growth in emergency rate room use around uh, over the past uh, decade compared to other places around the country. Um, you are also, you are the second highest in using outpatient procedures in the hospital. Um, so lots of stuff getting done, not inpatient, but outpatient. Um, and you have the third highest rate of surgeries of any place in the country. Now, why is that? Not sure. Uh, is it because you have an older population? Well, maybe, but uh, Florida is older. Florida is here. <laughs> so, not just because there's older people uh, living in Maine. It's positive. Um, you're actually doing a little bit better than the national average in terms of how often those chronic disease patients end up in the hospital. Um, but there's places, again, that um, in the country, other places like Utah, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, that um, are doing 25 to 30% better than you. So, um, and when you do send those patients to the hospital, though, one out of five, one out of four times, they come back to the hospital again in 30 days. Get readmitted at 95% rate. So, my conclusion from that is that not quite clear all the reasons why you may have higher health insurance premiums, but there is a lot of room for improvement here in Maine uh, if you try to tackle those things. Um, but the single biggest problem you have is lack of information. Because doctors don't have good information about how often this is happening, how often are their patients going to the hospital, how often are patients in the hospital getting infections. Many people don't really even know that. Um, and, you know, what are the prices of these things that we're sending referring patients to? Most people don't know because that's all secret. So if you're going to fix that, fundamentally you've got to find some way to analyze the data to find out where these opportunities for improvement are. And then you've got to be able to have real-time feedback on how you're doing. And when I show you numbers from two or three years ago, not soon enough. You've got to be able to get more current information to be able to help them. Um, now, Maine has really been one of the leaders nationally, thanks to the efforts of the Maine Health Management Coalition, in getting good quality, comparative information transparency out, so people know what the differences are in quality amongst different hospitals, different physician practices. Um, but 
you guys start moving now to talking about how do we get data on utilization? How do we get data on cost? Because if you just say all we really care about is measuring quality, well, let's just stop somebody from saying we'll spend a lot more money to get that quality. And firstly, you don't want to just look at cost because you don't want to have people getting care inappropriately uh, cheap. You got to have both. Now, a lot of health plans will say we need to give data to people about that. But if you're the physician and you have a few minutes to try to look at this, are you going to say, well, let's see, which report should I open? Should I open the report from Aetna? Should I open the report from Cigna or Anthem? All of which are formatted differently, all of which have different information. You want to understand what's happening with your overall patient population. And a lot of individual providers say, well, we have data on our patient, what we do. But how do they know whether they're actually doing well if they don't have a way to compare? And how do employers and consumers in the community know how different providers are doing? if you don't have comparable data. So you really got to have multi-payer and multi-provider data to be able to help that and have it really be a community initiative to say, where are these opportunities where we can save money? And how do we organize ourselves in a way to do that? Now, who should be accountable for all of that? Well, um, for years we've acted like that's a health plan's job to somehow be accountable. Or a hospital's job. But fundamentally, if you think about the things that I have talked about, uh, it's really physicians that are at the core of that. It's the physicians that are going to be helping people stay well, helping them stay out of the hospital, and making sure that the kinds of care changes that are needed to take place to be able to reduce infections and complications and readmissions. Um, but physicians are going to have to change the way they practice in order to be able to accomplish that. They're going to need to be able to figure out how to manage patient populations in a way that can keep people out of the hospital. They'll need to be able to work better in a more coordinated fashion with other physicians so people aren't all ordering the same test because nobody talked to each other. Um, and physicians and hospitals are going to have to work together in a more collaborative fashion in order to be able to do this. Now, um, the natural reaction is, well, if doctors are accountable, and if we're talking about lower spending, well, is that going to mean lower income? So are doctors basically cutting their own income to be able to do this? Well, not necessarily. Uh, and the reason is very simple. Because if you look at where are healthcare dollars going, this is where they're going. This is the commercial dollars, almost a trillion dollars nationally. Here's Medicare. Um, and you'll notice something very surprising, uh, simple and surprising, is doctors, physicians themselves, are only about a quarter to a fifth of the total money. The spending primarily is somewhere else. And the spending is stuff that physicians either prescribe control or influence. So physicians have an opportunity to find ways to save money in the rest of the system without necessarily having themselves get less money. So what can physicians do to be able to reduce costs and reduce the rate of growth in costs? Well, they can look at those acute episodes in the hospital and figure out how to reduce the infections and complications of readmissions, which we know how to do, which Gary Feinstein talked about this morning. We can look at, they can help look at the chronic disease patients and figure out how to help them stay well and stay out of the hospital, which will reduce spending, both of us reduce spending. And maybe then we can actually invest a little bit more in wellness care and still have overall less spending. But the opportunity is that while overall spending is going down, uh, and maybe we can actually reduce insurance administration costs a little bit too, is physician payments may actually be able to go up, not down because that's the win-win opportunity is if you can find ways to take dollars out of all those other things, then that doesn't necessarily mean the physician's income is going to have to go down. Let me give you an example. So for example, uh, American College of Cardiology has done studies basically saying that the uh, rate at which implantable defibrillators are being done is really is too high. A lot of people are getting them who don't need them. Um, and it's a bad thing to get it if you don't need it. You're going through surgery, you have all the risks associated with that. So um, uh, the rate of that is too high. So what gets paid for implantable defibrillator? Well, a typical number around the country right now is on the order of $30,000. Now, the doctor, notice, only gets paid $1,200. The hospital is getting paid on the order of $30,000. And the majority of the hospital's money isn't even going to, it's not going to the hospital administrator or even the nurses, it's going to buy the implant. Now, if I said we've got, you know, in a particular market, let's say that there's 200 cases. So health plans, Medicare, et cetera, may be paying $6 million for 200 of these cases. A lot of money. And if I said, you know, 20% too many, we've got to reduce that. 
what happens? We put some guidelines in place for what would happen. Well, uh, the payment would be happy. 20% less money. They're saving a million dollars. But guess what? The doctor's making 20% less. Hospital's making 20% less. So it's not exactly a prescription for cooperation and how do we get rid of these procedures. But that's not actually the right way to go about it. The right way to go about it is to say, can we actually do that procedure more efficiently? Is there a way that we can save money and do it less cost? Now, for example, what if we could get the implant at a lower cost? What if we could get that for 10% less? Not cheaper, crappier implant, but basically asking for discounts from uh, the provider, maybe by using the same implant rather than every doctor using um, a different implant. Now, the problem is the way we pay for healthcare today. Where does that savings go if you were to get that $2,000 savings? Well, it all goes to the hospital. Hospital would be happy. That would actually triple the hospital's margin on the, on the case in my particular hypothetical example. The doctor gets no benefit out of that. But if I were to say, let's think about how the hospital and the physician can share in this. I can divide it up differently. I can give $600 to the physician. That's a 50% increase in how much the physician is being paid for that procedure. I can give $450 to the hospital. That's a 50% increase in the hospital's margin. And I can give $950 back to the payer which is a 2% reduction. But you say, you know, but the point is there's 20% too many of these being done. So why does the payer only get to save 2%? Well, now that you've reinvented the procedure, um, what I can do is I can say, now, if I reduce the number of cases by 20%, now the payer spends 22% less, but the doctor is actually making more money and the hospital is making more money than they were before. Because I've reinvented the way the care was being done, so that I've made the margins higher, and now I don't have to do as many of those procedures in order to be able to make the same amount of money. Patients are better off because they're not getting procedures that were actually they didn't need and they were bad for them. Doctors are better off. Hospitals are better off. The implant manufacturers might be a little unhappy, but everybody else is uh, better, better off. Um, and if you don't think that that's possible, that absolutely is possible. Um, I told the story before I did a seminar about a year ago with a doctor from uh, Texas who's participating in the Medicare acute care episode demonstration where they've actually bundled hospital and physician and surgeon patient games together. He's a total hip and knee guy. He said, before this program, I didn't even know how much my implants cost. I had no idea. He said, now I do. Now I care. So I used to get one, one of the implants that I used used to cost the hospital $9,600. The exact same implant is now costing the hospital $5,200. Exact same implant. Because when the doctors went to the implant manufacturers and said, we're prepared to switch if you don't give us a better deal, they all rushed in with discounts. That doesn't exist today. Now, it's not just implants. There's all kinds of things. And this is what you heard from Karen Feinstein's presentation. There's huge opportunity in healthcare to be able to reduce costs. But it requires everybody to be working together as a team to find those things and to have the incentive to be able to do that. And we can create that through different kinds of uh, payment structures. The problem is that the payment system that we have today goes exactly the opposite direction of everything I talked about. Today, doctors and hospitals lose money if they prevent infections and complications and reactions. They lose money if people go to the hospital less often. And nobody in healthcare makes any money at all today when the patient stays well, which is not exactly a prescription for success in terms of being able to achieve these kinds of goals. So what do you do? Well, there's two basic ideas, um, uh, big ideas in healthcare payment reform. One is the notion of paying on an episode basis, is to say, if you go into the hospital for a day, that rather than paying the hospital separately and the doctor separately, and every time there's an infection, you pay more, you basically say there's a single price. And that will cover everything that happens within that hospitalization. It's the same example that every other industry in America has of giving a warranty on what they do. Other cases when you go and take your car to the auto shop and they do something bad, they fix it free of charge. They don't say, we screwed up your car, you have to pay. Now, this sounded like an insane idea in healthcare up until a few years ago when the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania started to do this. They said, we're going to have a single price for healthcare when we deliver it. Everything, physician, hospital, post-acute care, and any related complications or readmissions. 
And they started this with cardiac bypass surgery, and they have been systematically expanding it ever since to all sorts of other procedures, including things like maternity care and back pain, which don't even necessarily involve a hospitalization at all. And what they found was not little itsy bitsy statistically significant improvements, but large improvements in reductions in infections and complications and readmissions, 20, 40, 60 percent, quickly, 18 months. <laughs> at a place that was already known as a high-quality provider because the different payment structure enabled them to completely reinvent the way they were delivering care. And what did that, has that led to there? Well, um, they proudly say the teachers in the local school district, for example, were able to get higher raises because we were able to hold premiums down in the health plan, the guys in your health plan, because of the way we have been reinventing care to be able to do better outcomes at lower cost. Now, the myth that has developed is that you have to be a Geisinger health system, a big integrated delivery system with all the physicians employed, your own health plan to be able to do this. The earliest documented example of anybody giving a warranty in healthcare was a single doctor in Lansing, Michigan, told the guy said, I'm going to give a two year warranty. Anything goes wrong, I'll fix it free of charge. And, and it's in the literature the health plan paid less, the doctor made more, the hospital made more, and the patients were better off because they were able to reinvent care and stop worrying about the fact that if they did less, they lost money. And to be able to spend money on the things that really matter without having to worry about whether an insurance company was paying for them or not. So this can be done by big systems and by individual doctors and hospitals if they want to. Now, episodes sound good. The biggest disadvantage of the episode approach is that what does it do to prevent unnecessary episodes? You take all those chronic disease patients that we're talking about, the idea is not simply that every time they go to the hospital, they have a good and successful outcome, but they have them go to the hospital less often. And we want to be able to reduce the rate at which we're doing unnecessary surgeries and cardiac procedures and back surgeries, etc. So that leads to the second big idea, which is what I like to call comprehensive care payment. Single payment for a patient's condition or set of conditions, regardless of what happens physician and health system is responsible for managing all of that for single price. price. Um, and same notion of the warranty, but taken up to a larger level. We're going to help manage the patient's condition, and so that having them go to the hospital is actually a cost to us, because that's a bad thing to have to the patient. The patient doesn't want to go to the hospital, cost money. Um, this is what uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts has been doing through what they call the alternative quality contract. Single payment for a population of patients. It gets adjusted up or down based on whether the patients are sick or well, so the provider isn't taking insurance risks, so they're not stuck with the fact that they end up with a sicker patient population. They get paid more for that. They get a quality bonus. And the important aspect of this is it's a five-year contract. Rather than the single every year new contract, this actually gives an incentive to be able to invest in wellness, to be able to invest in new kinds of care delivery systems, and be able to reap the benefits of that. And they've had very broad participation in this, including an independent practice association with as few as 72 primary care physicians. They've seen quality improve, costs go down. It's been published this, this, this past year in the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American Medical Association of Health Affairs, what they have been able to do. Um, how do they do that? Well, there are lots and lots of studies that have shown that we can get, again, not small, but very large reductions, 20, 40, 60 percent reductions in the rate at which people with chronic disease get admitted to the hospital, use the emergency room, by doing very simple things, by having a nurse care manager work with them to be able to uh, help them edu educate them about their disease, how to be able to do better self-management, self to use things like telemonitoring to be able to identify early on when patients are having problems. But why do we do these things? Well, the answer is because we don't pay. This is the current healthcare payment system. We pay physicians for office visits. We don't pay doctors for phone calls. If you ever wonder why it's hard to get your doctor on the phone, they don't get paid to answer the phone. They only get paid if there's a patient sitting in their office. They don't get paid to hire a nurse care manager to be able to work with patients, even though we know that will help. But every time the patient shows up in the ER, every time they get a test, every time they show up in the hospital, we pay. I met a few weeks ago in Cleveland a family practitioner. Um, we had an all-day payment reform summit there where we brought all the stakeholders, employers, and, health, and physicians, and hospitals, and health plans together to decide how to fix this. 
And she stood up and she said, I have agreed to voluntarily cut my salary in half because I concluded that the only way I can take good care of my patients is to have a nurse. And nobody would pay for the nurse. So the only way I can get a nurse is to cut my own salary to be able to pay for the nurse. That's a pretty sad statement about the healthcare payment structure when a physician, a family practice physician, who's not making a whole lot of money to begin with, has to cut their salary to be able to provide good services for their patients. So the idea of this comprehensive care payment, or global payment, love you, love you, love, is to say, you have the flexibility to be able to decide what's good for the patients. If seeing them in the office is good, fine, but if talking to them on the phone whenever they have a problem is good, great. If you need to hire a nurse, that's fine, as long as you can make sure that it will, in fact, help keep the patients out of the hospital, out of the ER, uh, reduce the number of tests, etc. So you have flexibility, but accountability for, for being able to make it all work. Let me show you some numbers just to give you a sense of how this can work. So here's a hypothetical underpaid BCP practice. Four docs. Um, they have uh, 2,000 patients each. They're getting about a million one a year from the health plan. Uh, a bunch of that money goes to pay for overhead, and then they end up getting a $180,000 salary each. At the same time, their patients are showing up in the ER at the rate of 200 per thousand. Typical commercial rate, probably low for me. 40% um, of those ER visits are preventable in typical rate from a number of studies around the country. Everything from sniffles that doesn't need to go to the emergency room to chronic disease exacerbations that could be better managed by the physician. Health plans pay $1,000 every time those patients show up in the ER. They're spending $640,000 a year paying for preventable ER visits. Now, this primary care practice might say, well, what if we were to hire a nurse practitioner who could actually spend some time with the patients who have chronic disease, help them manage their, their conditions, and be able to answer the phone when the patient calls, maybe do some um, uh, extended office hours. Um, and we think that if we did that, we could reduce the number of preventable ER visits by 40%. 40% of the 40%. Number that a lot of medical home projects around the country have been able to achieve, so it's not at all unrealistic. That would save the health plan a quarter million dollars. But look at how the economics work today. The primary care practice would have to pay the $90,000 out of their own pocket in order to save the health plan a quarter million dollars. Now you can see there's a deal that can be struck here. The deal is, what if the health plan would pay the primary care practice the $90,000 to pay for the nurse practitioner? They would still end up saving net $166,000. Now, the health plan, though, looks at this and says, hmm, if I pay them, though, for the nurse practitioner, how do I know that they're actually going to use the nurse to keep patients out of the ego? Well, that's where you can add a little bit of an incentive into this and say, if, in fact, you successfully reduce the ER utilization rate, we'll give you half of the net savings. So if they gave half of that $166,000, $83,000 back, the health plan is still saving 13% over what they were spending before. But if they gave that to the primary care practice, that $83,000 would mean a 12% increase in this primary care physician's salary. Win, win, win. The patients are better off and not using the ER as much. The primary care physicians are making more money. The health plan is paying less. But to make it work, you have to have a payment system that will actually provide the flexibility to be able to pay for that upfront cost. And the primary care practice has to have targets, things that they actually can control. They can't control the infection rate in the hospital, but they can certainly control the rate at which patients are using the ER. So that's the opportunity that different payment systems provide, is to be able to let both patients and doctors and health plans benefit. Now, you might say, if you're a primary care physician, well, this is great. We're going to go and we're going to do this and we're going to take all that money out of the hospital side and be a big upside for us. Um, and it's true, physicians, because physicians are the ones that are really managing care in many cases, can save a lot of money simply through their own uh, actions. Um, and as long as the hospital doesn't do things to raise its costs, then you've actually reduced net spending. But what stops the hospital from saying, oh, you've taken away all of our ER visits and all of our chronic disease admissions, we're going to raise our prices. Or we're going to fill up those beds with other people. And if that happens, spending may still go up, which then ends up with no benefit to that physician practice. So we have to be thinking about how physicians and hospitals can work together in the community. There is a piece of the equation that primary care physicians can do. They can help manage those patients, those chronic disease patients, reduce ER visits, help them stay out of the hospital. 
There's stuff that has to happen by the specialists in the hospital, in the hospital to be able to reduce infections and complications. And when you take some of those really complicated patients, everybody has to really be working together to manage that if we're going to actually reduce total healthcare costs. So that's really the vision of what people are talking a lot about today is the notion of an accountable care organization. And wholly aside from all the machinations about how the payment structure is, basically the idea is having physicians and hospitals working together to manage patient care in a way that enables total costs to come down while quality to actually uh, improve. Now the one person we haven't talked about yet is the patient. Talked about doctors and hospitals and how they get paid. Um, the payment system is about how the provider, the doctor, the hospital, how they get the ability and the incentives to be able to keep patients well, to be able to coordinate their care, to be able to avoid unnecessary services. But next to the tango, so the patient also needs the ability and the incentives to be able to stay well, to be able to do the things that will help them improve their health, to take their medications to be able to allow somebody to coordinate their care and to pick the highest value provider. And those things really get determined on the benefit side of the equation, what's the patient's benefit structure. And we really don't do a very good job today of giving patients benefit structures that help them do that. Um, we are obsessed in healthcare today with co-pays, co-insurance, and high deductibles. And frankly, I think we don't even remember why we put them in place in the first place. Now it's become simply a method of how do we get the cost to get paid by the patients rather than just by the employers. And they have two very undesirable aspects. One is that in many cases they can actually prevent patients from getting the kind of preventive care that they need. I think one of the biggest single examples of that is that we have this almost complete disconnect today between pharmacy benefits and medical benefits. So if you think about those chronic disease patients that I've been talking about, what is it that actually helps them stay out of the hospital? It's taking their chronic disease maintenance medication. If they have emphysema, it's using their inhaler. If, it's, if they have chronic um, uh, congestive heart failure, it's taking their heart pills, uh, diuretics, whatever. And if the co-pays for those medications are too high, or if they're on Medicare and they're in the Medicare donut hole where they have to pay 100% of the cost themselves, and the patients don't take their meds because they can't afford them, and they end up in the hospital, what's the doctor supposed to do about that? What's the hospital supposed to do about that? That's the benefit side. The other thing that we do with, uh, with um, co-pays, co-insurance, and high deductibles is that we think somehow that's giving patients an incentive to use lower cost treatments and providers. And it doesn't. Let me take out healthcare for a second. Let me talk about air filters. So I was um, in Boston this summer, and I had to be in Cleveland the next day. I live in Pittsburgh. And so my plan was to fly back to Pittsburgh and then drive to Cleveland. And folks in Cleveland said, why are you doing that? Why don't you just fly directly to Cleveland from Boston? So I thought, OK, well, let me see. So I looked up the prices. Um, well, uh, there's three choices I had for going to Pittsburgh. I could either go um, US Airways, one stop through Philadelphia for $622. Or I could get United, that would get me nonstop, but for $1,100. And they also had first class seats available. I can get for $1,355. Now, what if I got paid for my travel expenses the same way we ask employees to pay for their health care? What if they said to me, my employer said to me, $100 co-payment, you pay. What am I going to do? Really tough choice there, huh? What if I said 10% co-insurance? Now, it would cost me more to go United nonstop, first class. Cost me $74 more. Does anybody here who has any flexibility with their money, would they say, oh no, I wouldn't go. I'd rather spend all that time going coach on two different flights here in Philadelphia. What if you had a $500 deductible? Which one would I pick? The only thing that would actually encourage me to pick the lower cost choice, because all these get me there in a high quality fashion, you know, I'm getting there safely for the stuff that matters. The only thing that would actually get me there to use the lower cost was to say, we'll pay for the lowest cost coach fare. And if you think those other things are worth it, Harold, you can pay for the difference. Now, let's suppose in healthcare, you have to get your knee fixed. 
And there's three choices in the community. One costs $20,000, one costs $25,000, one costs $30,000. Under typical healthcare benefit designs, which one are you going to pick? Well, I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, well, co-pay, same thing. Uh, Co-insurance, because there's not a pocket max, same thing. I got the same thing. There must be something good about the place that charges $30,000. I don't know what. <laughs> but it must be better or it wouldn't cost more, right? I'm going to go there because it doesn't matter to me. The only thing that actually gets me to choose the lower cost providers is to say, you know what? You can get a high quality knee replacement for $20,000. We'll pay $20,000. If you think the place that charges $10,000 more is worth it, go ahead and pay it. And in fact, I think that's actually a better choice for employees than having health plans or employers saying, we'll pick for you. We will decide that you have to go to the place that charges $20,000. And we'll charge a $1,000 copay to move. And then if you want to go to the other two, you'll have to pay twenty-five dollars or $30,000. I think giving people an open choice in a tiered network is a whole lot better than SSD than forcing them to go to one particular place. But that's up to the community to decide. Massachusetts Blue Cross Blue Shield is actually putting a policy like this in place. I understand state health employees, health commissioners are trying to use something like this. to say because under their alternative quality contract, one of the challenges that the providers have is to say, well, if we're not responsible for managing total costs, what's the incentive for the patients in that contract to use the lower cost providers? So they basically said that the higher cost hospitals are going, they're going to be a higher copay if you use a higher cost hospital. Now the challenge that we have today is if you just do it on this basis, what does it mean to be a higher cost hospital? So for example, let's suppose I had two different hospitals in the community doing the same thing, and one of them charged $10,000 for the procedure and one of them charged $9,500. Well, should we incent the employee to go to buyer number two because it's 5% lower cost? Well, the problem is, what else goes on? What if we discovered that, in fact, the first provider had a 5% rate of infection, but the second one had a 10% rate of infection? And that when you talk about the cost of treating those infections and add that all in, it turns out that that second provider might look cheaper on the surface. But it actually costs more when you take an all-in cost. When you factor in all the infections and complications and other things. Um, that's the problem with the way we pay for health care, because you can't actually see what the total cost is for any kind of a procedure. Um, if you had a bundled episode price for this, and you would say they're going to, they're not going to charge for infections anymore. They're going to charge for they're going to give you a total price, then you would be able to decide. Truthfully, which one was really the better value? You could look at their quality and you could compare total cost and see which one makes sense. And in that case, it might well be provider number one, even though they end up charging more when you looked at the typical price uh, today. Um, you have to match that with good quality information because you can't just look at price, you have to look at quality. And in fact, that's something that's going to be increasingly important if we actually try to make providers more responsible for cost. But you have a really good foundation already in the community being able to measure quality. What you need now is the ability to be able to measure costs so that you can get truly a comprehensive uh, picture of this. Now, one other thing though. So, um, you know, I thought, wow, oh, it's really interesting. I was planning to fly back to Pittsburgh and drive to Cleveland. Um, but that would cost a lot more to get to Cleveland. Uh, $1,100 nonstop. I can get to Pittsburgh nonstop for $188. What is that? Is it because Cleveland's farther? Yeah, a little bit. So, really, 70 miles more means $900. Is there something wrong with the airline industry? Uh, yeah, what's the issue is, there is only one choice of how to get from Boston to Cleveland nonstop. There are three choices of how to get from Boston to Pittsburgh nonstop. So, is it any surprise? that prices are lower on the one where there's competition than the one there are. So one of the things that you have to be thinking about in Maine is when we move to accountable care organizations, are you going to have a choice of accountable care organizations? Or are you not? And one of the trends that we're seeing around the country is that a lot of providers are trying to simply get as big as they possibly can to control everything. On the premise that they're trying to ensure maximum coordination. 
but you have to say, well, is that actually going to ensure the best value for the community? Because if I don't have any choices, how do I know that I'm going to be able to get the lowest cost, highest quality care? And I think what patients actually will want in this structure that we're trying to move towards is they'd like to have a good primary care medical home, helping them manage their condition, coordinate care, but then they'd also like to have the choice of which provider to go to based not just on quality, but quality and cost. And I think most people believe, rightly or wrongly, that different hospitals do different things well. And I wouldn't necessarily want to be locked into any one particular uh, system. So to me, the notion, the, the right notion of an accountable care organization is to say, how can we give patients the ability to be in a system that gives them good, high quality primary care medical home, and the ability to get the best, lowest cost care, whoever ends up providing it. Now, if that's the notion of the accountable care organization, what that does then is it actually creates an incentive for hospitals to be good at everything. Not because the patient is locked in to all using that hospital, but because the hospitals actually are delivering the highest quality, lowest cost care for everything. Uh, or in some cases, maybe some hospitals will simply decide, rather than continuing to try to offer everything that we're not good at, maybe we should stop doing some things and have the patients get that particular kind of procedure somewhere else because they can be better at it. Now, what does this all mean to hospitals? Well, um, it doesn't exactly take more than a couple seconds thought to think that if we actually follow this model that I was talking about, how do you keep people well, how do you avoid having to go to the hospital as often, how do you make sure that they have fewer infections, complications, or readmissions, that's going to mean fewer patients in the hospital, fewer lower hospital revenues. It's interesting, this is probably the one industry in America, hospital care, where we would actually like the business to sell less product. We would like our manufacturing firms in Maine to sell more product. That would be a good thing for me. But this is a case where we would actually like to sell less product. So it's kind of hard to imagine how this is not going to all be successful if you don't end up with lower hospital revenues. And if you think there's some other way around, then all you have to do is look at the chart. Where is all the money in healthcare going? It is going to hospitals. What has been the biggest increase in healthcare spending over the past decade? It's been hospitals. It's not drugs anymore. It's hospital care. So we're going to have to find a way to take dollars out of hospitals. But we had to figure out the right way to do that. Because the problem is that hospitals, like most other businesses, have a lot of fixed costs. And particularly, hospitals have a lot of fixed costs that are trying to provide important services in the community. So you could have a situation where a hospital, let's say we're really successful, and we keep all those chronic disease patients out of the hospital, and we reduce the rate of unnecessary surgeries, and the hospital has a 20% reduction in admissions. Its costs may only go down by, say, 7%. So it still has to staff the emergency room, and it still has to have the MRI available for whatever you need. All those costs still have to be covered. But health plans, employers, under the current structure, would happily pay them 20% less. Now, you may have to have an advanced degree in hospital finance to figure out what this means. 20% less revenue, 7% lower costs. Probably means the hospital's going to have financial problems. Because it's getting, it, losing more revenue than it's losing costs. But what it also means is that if the payers were paying the right amount at the beginning of this, they are no longer paying the right amount. Because, in fact, the unit cost of, of care has gone up. The hospital is selling less product, but it has to still maintain some key fixed costs to be able to do that appropriately. And the unit cost goes up. Spending can go down. So there is a middle ground where you could say, we've got to renegotiate the prices with the hospitals to make sure that we still save some money, but that we don't put the hospital into bankruptcy. Because while we might be okay with a manufacturing firm going out of business if they can't sell enough product anymore, we will not be happy with all of our hospitals going out of business. So this is going to vary from hospital to hospital. If you are a hospital that's bulging at the seams, you might be happy to lose a lot of those chronic disease admissions because that means you don't have to build that new wing you're worried about trying to build before. And, um, and be able to, to use the space for uh, patients who need it more. But if you're a small community hospital, this is a lot of what fills the beds in community hospitals, is the chronic disease patients that we're trying to help stay well and stay out of the hospital. 
So I think there's going to have to be a new kind of conversation going on between employers, health plans, and hospitals about how to make this transition. Hospitals are going to have to restructure, but it takes time to restructure. And they have to have some certainty about where the needs are going to go in the community. And then the payers have to say, we'll pay you differently so that it doesn't put you out of business because we still save some money. That's that sharing uh, notion. And I think in a lot of communities, Maine has a lot of hospitals. You have to think about how do you reorganize in some fashion? Because the fee-for-service system structure that we have had today is driving every hospital to add capacity, to be able to do everything. And we've ended up with, in many cases, lots of duplication. So we may have to be thinking about how do communities start to think about a better and more efficiently managed network. Not necessarily everybody to consolidate, but that you say we're not going to have as many places all trying to do the same things as we do today um, uh, to be able to make that work out better. What does this mean for people who work in healthcare? Well, if you work for a hospital, this might make you nervous. Uh, it might make you particularly nervous in Maine because Maine has more people working in hospitals per capita than almost any place in the country. But it doesn't necessarily have to mean that lower spending is necessarily lower personnel costs. Why is that? Well, if you look at what has happened to hospital costs over the past two decades, Hospital costs have gone up dramatically, but hospital employment hasn't. Unless the people working in hospitals are somehow all, on average, making $175,000 a year, which I don't think they are. <laughs> um, I'm not good at the soft shoes, so I'll stop it. Um, so, in fact, if you look at hospitals today, and you look at hospitals in Maine, about 50% of hospital spending is not personnel spending. It's buying all that equipment and buying all that, as Karen said, stuff they keep in the supply closet that people don't even use all the time. And it's spending more for the devices and things that we're not being able to get as efficiently as we can. So there's opportunities to be able to save. So what does it mean for the healthcare workforce? I think that proportionally we're going to see more jobs in the community than in hospital. Proportionally. We're going to be seeing uh, more home health nurses rather than hospital nurses. We're going to be seeing more people working in primary care offices rather than hospitals. Um, and more jobs in general in primary care. I think the challenge to everybody working in healthcare is how to find ways to be able to achieve these kinds of goals. How to keep the patients well, how to avoid hospitalizations, how to eliminate those infections and complications. And if you're in a hospital, how do you actually make the hospital itself more efficient so that the hospital can operate on lower revenues without resulting in large layoffs? And today, if you can't figure out how to change the way the hospital is structured, the only way the CFO has to be able to reduce costs is say we're going to do layoffs or we're going to hold down wages. But if you can reinvent, you can find other ways to save. How about health plans? So I've talked about almost everything with health plans. Well, if you think about it, the way we have health plans uh, America, uh, healthcare in America structure today, people think they buy their health care from health plans. And then health plans turn around in some contract with all the PCPs and the hospitals in the community. We've stuck health plans in the middle of what is basically a process that in every other industry people buy directly from the provider of the service. Uh, and that creates some really undesirable things, many of which TR Reid is talking about today. So the health plan loses when the patient is sick. So they want to try to reduce the number of cases in which they actually pay when a patient needs uh, care. Um, and they win if the patient gets less treatment, even if the patient needs it. And conversely, then on the other side, the incentive is they try to find ways um, to, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the providers end up with a structure where they basically, they're not charging the patient directly. Um, so the physician doesn't get paid if the patient stays well. They only get paid for health care services. Um, and if the patient gets more treatment, they profit. So having the intermediary causes a problem. Now, one way to think about this accountable care organization thing is just to say, well, everything else stays the same. This is just a new way of organizing the providers and working on but I think a more fundamental way to think about it is this is a fundamentally a way of saying, let's take the health plans out of the middle of all this. Let's have the 
providers have a structure that enables them to be in the middle, that enables patients to be able and, for, and employers to be able to buy care from them. The health plans are still needed for some very important roles because they're the ones that still structure the payment under this model. It's now a global payment, a comprehensive care payment that is based on the patient's conditions. Um, and they end up covering all those unusually expensive patients, which is not appropriate for even accountable care organizations to deal with. And they can actually help the systems by you know, helping them analyze their data, et cetera. Um, and then it's the provider organization that's actually now responsible for figuring out how to uh, do a better job of getting care and gets rewarded for doing that whenever they deliver a better uh, uh, care for the patient. And then they are now responsible for monitoring their own cost of quality, not having a health plan do it. Um, now, the other thing is that health plans can also be over on the other side of the equation, as they are today. Still working with employers to be able to help patients do the wellness programs, etc., so that the providers can stay focused on how do you actually manage care because that's not typically the upstream stuff is not what most doctors and hospitals are structured to be able to do. So looking forward, what's the role of health plans? Is it to stay in the middle between patients, employers, and the providers? Or is it to actually now become partners with employers and patients or partners with accountable care organizations? to let those two sides actually work together more directly. And I think that transition needs to happen. And health plans have a lot of competencies, but they need to split up those competencies now and start selling them separately to the different sides of the equation, helping the patients and the providers work more directly together. And we've got to get this to work across the board for all the health plans, because uh, these payment change structures that we have, it doesn't work if you're a physician and you're getting one health plan, Medicare or Aetna or somebody saying, we'll actually now pay you in a way that rewards you if you reduce infections, and everybody else is penalizing you whenever you reduce infections. What are you supposed to do? Okay, I'm going to give you an infection, but I'm not going to give you an infection. It doesn't work that way. Healthcare, you've got to be able to change it for everybody. So you've got to find a way to get all of the payment systems and all these benefit changes aligned across all the payers. Now, I'm not worried that health plans aren't going to change. My biggest worry is that they're all going to change in different ways. Um, we are starting to see some uh, coordination around the country, including here in Maine, where we actually have all the health plans, all the payers are working together to be able to change this care. You have to have some kind of a convener to do this, either the state or a nonprofit collaborative like Maine Health Management Coalition. And Medicare is now finally starting to be at the table and is actually consenting, rewarding regions for being able to do this job. But if everybody goes in their own direction, change the payment. You're going to end up with, maybe you have better incentives, but the doctors and hospitals are going to spend more time trying to figure out seven different payment systems than they are trying to change the way you care to live. So we've got to get alignment not just in changing, but changing uh, in similar ways. Um, and what if the health plans won't change? Well, what's happening in growing up in communities is that the employers are saying, okay, if the health plans won't change, we're going to change health plans. Because it's more important for the community to have a common system than whatever I thought I was gaining out of the health plan that I was using before. So that's another sea change that's starting to happen around the country. Now, lots of stuff has to happen. And this is why it's fundamentally um, important to understand all these different pieces. So you've got to change the payment structure. You've got to change the benefit design structure for employees. You've got to have the providers change the way they deliver care and the way they're structured. And they're going to need help to be able to do that. You're going to have to have data on cost and quality to be able to inform this whole process. And at the very, very fundamental level, you've got to have consumers engaged and educated about this. And all these pieces have to work together. They can't be going off in separate silos. So the question is, who is it that's going to coordinate all that? How many people vote for the federal government doing that? That's really the notion of having a regional health improvement collaborative in the community. Not somebody who delivers care or pays for care, but a nonprofit entity that can help bring all those pieces together in a coordinated way and does it with all the stakeholders at the table. Because if you gain any one thing out of all the stuff I've said, is that everybody's going to have to change. And they're all going to have to change in coordinated ways. And they have to have a mechanism of coming together and talking to each other and trying to work out the inevitable problems that will arise. And so we have a growing number around the country of these regional health improvement collaborators. And you are lucky to have two of the leading ones in the country here, the Maine Health Management Coalition, Quality Counts that provide that kind of mechanism for the
for the community to come together and to be able to work on these issues. So, what are the key ways, in summary, that have to change? You've got to have data. Fundamentally, you've got to have data on a multi-payer, multi-provider basis to be able to identify what those win-win-win opportunities are for the community so that you can actually reduce costs and improve quality in ways that are better for patients. You've got to have to have new skills and capabilities on the part of doctors and hospitals. And you've heard a lot about from Karen Feinstein about the mechanisms of being able to change that. We have techniques to do it. There simply has to be a willingness and support for doing it. You're going to have to have patients having the information and the skills to make value-based choices about the care of the providers that they use. There's going to have to be hospitals are going to have to restructure. It is inevitable. If we're going to save money, we're going to have to find a way to restructure the way hospitals deliver care. Um, and they're going to need a multi-year transition to do that. It can't happen overnight. Health plans are going to have to support these changes in the community and support it in a coordinated way. Health plans can't be allowed to compete on which payment system is best. They have to work with the community to change payment in a common fashion. And then you've got to have all the stakeholders working together because there will inevitably be lots of bumps in the road, lots of challenges, and you don't want people going back in their corners and saying it was their fault that this all failed. Everybody's going to come together and say, how do we work through the challenges and be able to make this successful? Because this is all about all of us. How do we get good health care at a competitive rate? And fundamentally, this is about economic development in the community. Because I think the places in the country that can do this right, that can find, figure out how to change their systems to deliver lower cost, high quality care will be magnets for both businesses and people. And if Maine needs anything, it needs to have economic development. So this could be a real opportunity for you. So I encourage you all to become informed about these things. Lots more stuff on the website, but that is my uh, 78 RPM tour of everything from pay reform to benefit design delivery system structure. And I would be happy to take any questions challenges, disagreements, violence, or otherwise. <laughs>